As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. Today, our very special guest is a returning visitor, Andrew Hoffman, Marketing Director for Miles Franklin Precious Metals Investments. Andy Hoffman joins us after two decades on Wall Street in the mining industry and for the past four years plus in the retail bullion industry. In 2011, he joined Miles Franklin Precious Metals as its Marketing Director. He's penned roughly 1,000 free articles, taped 500 free podcasts, made countless presentations at investment conferences. And uh, he's here with us today to answer our questions about gold, silver, and what is going on. Andy, welcome here to Reluctant Preppers. Oh, it's a pleasure to be back. Now, we've got two questions we want to pose to you for sure today. One of them is, what in the world is going on with the low prices of physical gold and silver? People have been saying it's below the cost of production for over two years now, and yet it continues to drop and hit new lows. Is this going to go on forever? What's going to stop it from going on? And is the real cost of production much lower than we've been told? And if so, is the floor of potential prices much lower for physical than what we've seen so far? And secondly, in what priority should precious metals take in a preparedness plan for a given family? People talk about food, about shelter, about protection, weapons, escape plans, all sorts of other preparedness that they need to make, but where in that plan, what priority, both from an investment standpoint and a order of getting things done standpoint, should precious metals take in your view and why? So let's go back and start with that first question. What the heck is going on with physical precious metal prices? How long can this go on? And have we really seen the bottom yet? Or have we been given the wrong understanding of what the cost of production really is and what it means to how long this can be continued? Well, you know, you're saying we're told it's below the cost of production. I mean, it is. That's why the miners are all losing money. And um, they have, they've cut their spending to the bone. They've been hemorrhaging money for years. They're writing off assets. Their debt levels have exploded. Their share counts have exploded because of they've had to dilute themselves to pay down their debts and capex because they don't have the profits. I mean, that's, you know, you don't, you don't need to be told what the cost of production is. Uh, to, to you know to know that they're losing money. In fact, a lot of the miners that say they have low cost of production are losing money. I love when they they you know they use this archaic, actually they're stop they're finally stopping uh, you know starting to not use it anymore called cash cost, uh, which for many reasons is a, a miserable accounting uh, technique. It really doesn't measure anything. But they'll say yeah our our cash cost for silver is. Uh, is five dollars an ounce, and then you see that they lost money in the quarter. So how could it possibly five dollars an ounce if they're losing money at fourteen dollars, and so on and so forth? Uh, the fact is, yes, and I've done extensive studies on this. You can, you know, in silver, you can listen to our Miles Franklin uh, All Star webinar panel that we did uh, last year, and in fact, we're going to be doing a 2016 Silver Outlook. Uh, webinar on the 27th, which will be on the internet, and you can we'll talk all about that as well. But the fact is, for both gold and silver, we're well below the cost of production, not just for marginal mine, uh, not just for the marginal cost of production of producing mines, uh, but for you know certainly for the the lesser mines that are not public companies, and and then you have the sustaining cost of the industry, which would mean that cost to actually uh, replace reserves, or God forbid, increase them, and you know. And that would be that would take dramatically higher prices. So there's no doubt in my mind that we've already hit peak gold and silver uh, last year, 2015, and now you're going to see dramatic production declines because the price has been held below the cost of production for so long. As for why are they down for so long? Well, in the big scheme of things, four years is not that much, but it's been a four-year period of hyper. Uh, suppression. I mean, I've been in this sector now since 2002, and I've watched the suppression every minute of every day. Uh, but it really was 2011 when the, as I called them, the cartel, which is basically the U.S. government and you know the banks that that you know that that you know that work with them as their partners. They so they almost lost control of everything. The whole system was falling apart. Gold and silver prices were soaring, and they just you know doubled their efforts. Uh, so they pushed down the prices of gold and silver dramatically. Uh, to the point where they're below cost of production and destroying the mining industry. But that said, the, the, all the things that 
that caused gold and silver to rise up to those heights in 2011 have only gotten dramatically worse. I mean, back then, if you remember, in 2011, late 2011, when the U.S. lost its uh, AAA uh, credit rating and uh, it was all about the debt ceiling was $14.1 trillion. Oh, my God, what are we going to do? Well, now the debt is $19 trillion. And uh, all those things are much worse, the money printing, all the QE around the world, the negative interest rates. So I'm not worried about where gold is going because, one, economically, it's, it's so low that the miners are going out of business. And, of course, the other pink elephant in the room is that every year since we've had record demand. 2015, unequivocally, record global silver and gold demand. But you're seeing even more vicious paper uh, selling of gold and silver that doesn't exist. So, again, we're getting to the point where there's going to be a perfect storm. Of, uh, of, of shrinking supply, the, the, the inventories have been vanishing, demand is exploding, and of course the fundamentals are raging uh, and only going to be raging more as central banks continue to do psychotic things uh, to try to save themselves by you know, basically debasing currency. So that's where we stand today. It's kind of a crossroads in history, if you ask me. And uh, you know, to answer your question, I don't think even if they were crazy enough to try to push prices much lower than here, that they could because there'll be no mining industry left. And then a related question, even if this, uh, the driving forces that are motivating the suppression of the price continue and the efforts to suppress the price continue, at what point do realities of uh, business just take over, uh, in your view, based on the, the ill health of the mining industry? And the, is, do you see a horizon beyond which you think it's just unsustainable at, at current levels? Oh, I think we're there now. I think, and you know, again, we're we're at the we just the year just ended. So every year, aside from you know, at the end of the year, all businesses review their operations. They wait for the holidays and they say, "What's our game plan for the next year?" And so uh, on on top of that, where all the mining companies are going to be looking all the, at all their assets and saying, you know, we need to cut back more because we're not making money. They also are required every year to revise um, or re their uh, calculations of their reserves and resources. Um, <clears throat> so those accounting processes are going on right now using prices pretty much around where we are now because it's about where we ended the year. These prices are so far below the cost of production and pretty much in every case well below the, the price decks that most miners have been using price deck meaning the assumptions like a lot of gold companies are assuming 1200 or 1250 dollar gold in their reserve calculations a lot of silver companies are probably 15 17 18 so you're going to see some dramatic reserve write downs and again these companies have been you know building up debt for years to pay for operations because of the lack of profits caused by the cartel so because they're going to have write downs, they're going to have debt covenant violations because they won't have enough equity and that's going to cause more cutbacks and all kinds of problems. There's going to be mergers. Uh, when you have mergers, mergers paralyze the industry as they, as they get together all, all their overhead and figure out who they're going to fire and what projects they're going to, they're going to cancel and they're going to close mines. So that's going to all be going on now. But more importantly, if you're talking about silver specifically, gold is pretty much mined from primary gold mines. But roughly two-thirds of all the silver in the world, maybe even 70% of it, is the byproduct of other types of mines. Uh, and frankly, only about 10% of it is from gold mines, uh, which themselves are mostly underwater right now. But it's mostly from copper and lead zinc mines. And copper and lead zinc mines are getting destroyed right now. Miners are, are just, you know, getting destroyed financially. And they, too, are going to be writing down assets and closing up mines. So you're going to see a dramatic decline, in, in my view, uh, in silver production, which already started this year. I think from what we're seeing, silver production is probably, probably was down 5 to 10 percent in 2015. And now there's going to be a steep cliff. And in both cases, silver and gold, especially when you talk about primary miners, because the the, uh, the the price have been suppressed for so long. Capital expenditures have been so depressed for so long. There's been no discoveries, and as a result, even if prices do jump up right now, there's really nothing to develop of substance. I mean, there's a couple of legacy projects out there, but for the most part, there's no way it's going to replace all the the declines. Barrick Gold, which is the world's biggest miner, and by the way, the most indebted and in danger of bankruptcy if prices uh, do stay down here or, or, or God forbid go somewhat lower. Uh, I mean, Barrick is projecting, I think it's like a 30 or 40% decline in production 
in the next five or so years. And this is the biggest miner in the world. So the realities are hitting the road right now. And, uh, you know, I don't understand, you know, this cartel, which really, when I say cartel, the U.S. government does not want uh, people in gold and, you know, and skewing their paper monopoly on their fiat currency. So they hold the price down. But I don't even see what the motivation would be to make it go lower than now than it is right now, because they're only going to hurt themselves. They're just going to cause the mining industry to collapse further and cause less supply in a, in a business that's already tightly supplied. Uh, so I think this year is where the rubber hits the road. And again, you know, per what I wrote in uh, or scripted in my audio blog today that just came out, you know, there's a, the, it's the, the, the reason that gold and silver are not commodities, uh, although, yes, they are all the same per se, is that they have the exact opposite, the polar opposite fundamentals. Right now, pretty much all commodities, and that includes most food commodities too, uh, but certainly industrial commodities like oil and, and, and copper, uh, you know, you're seeing massive oversupply and falling demand. Gold and silver, you have record demand, plunging supply, and, and vanishing inventory. So, you know, this is going to be a crazy year across the board for the economy, uh, for the uh, for corporate earnings, and certainly for the metals markets. Yeah, corroborating uh, what you were saying about silver as a byproduct of copper mining, copper is at uh, near record lows uh, in the near term, and I learned today that Caterpillar Corporation, an icon of American industry that supports and provides capital equipment to the mining industry, had to lay off 30% of their workforce because of the pressure that those miners are not investing in capital equipment right now. Well, Ca- Caterpillar is in an all-time high, an all-time record recession for them. I mean, Caterpillar, I think it's something like 30 or 40 months in a row of declining year-over-year revenues. And, you know, Caterpillar is the biggest uh, mining equipment manufacturer in the world. Uh, and, you know, even the same is going for John Deere, which makes all that farming machinery. It's the, you know, the kind of an equivalent-type business where it's falling apart. Uh, and you're seeing it across, I mean, right now, the global economy has, you know, ground to a halt. The the Baltic Dry Index, for instance, which measures uh, which which uh, which measures shipping activity, is at an all time low. It's talking about thirty years, and it's plunging. It's down like twenty percent just this year. I mean, we're in January fifteenth. It was uh, it was something like twenty three hundred three years ago. It's four hundred today. It's less than four hundred, and all kinds of things, uh, you know, including here in the states, rail car freight activity, you name it, everything is, you know, I, I wrote I wrote six months ago, we're in the worst economy of our lifetimes, the worst global economy of our lifetimes. And that was the good old days compared to today. I mean, the, the CRB commodity index just plunged through 40 year lows, which is pretty hard to do, considering that's when we went off the gold standard and started printing all that money and creating inflation. I mean, that's how much oversupply there is. And all that oversupply came from all the money printing. They created all this Free money, this cheap money. Wall Street created all their, you know, their financial derivatives and financial engineering, which put money into the hands of people like shale producers that should never have gotten it. And as a result, we have a, a worldwide wall of supply uh, in in industrial infrastructure, in commodities, etc., which is just going to take the world down. And it is. So again, you say, you know, when's gonna when's gold and silver gonna go up? Well, in pretty much all currencies except for. The dollar, which is where the manipulation is, is centered, uh, and where you know we have this reserve currency that everyone's fleeing into because it's more liquid. Everywhere else, the gold price is up. The bear market in gold, if you, I call it with the quotes around it, because it has nothing to do with the bear market. It's been suppressed. It ended years ago. I mean, if you live in Canada, the price of gold is, I think, it's just 14 percent from its all-time high. The same with Australia. Mexico's is close. In India is about 25 percent. If you're in the BRICs, like South Africa and, and Brazil and Russia, they're soaring to new all-time highs every day. I mean, you're talking about the average currency in this world is at near or below, or in some cases, well below its all-time lows. You talk about, you now people remember the uh, the ruble crisis of, uh, of 1998. Remember, it almost took the world down. Well, that was when the ruble was, tw- it went from 7 to the dollar to 20 to the dollar. Well, today it's 76 to the dollar. You know, people forget. Remember the uh, the Mexican tequila crisis of the uh, the mid to mid nineties, when the the price of the me- the peso went, I think, from like three to the dollar to six to the dollar. Well, today it's eighteen to the dollar, uh, and you're seeing this everywhere. Across. Remember the paper tigers, uh, the Malaysian currency back in nineteen ninety eight almost took down the world. Well, now it's lower than that. So again, 
around the world, gold and silver is high. There's, there's dramatic demand everywhere, which is why you have, you know, which is why you have record demand. It's just here in the little tiny part of the world where it happens to be where we have this quote reserve currency, and we also have the gold cartel. So Americans all think gold is down, but it's only down here. In the backdrop of that suppressed price, you've mentioned a couple times the record demand. Could you tell us where is this demand coming from? Specifically, who are the buyers of gold and silver globally? Well, it's the Eastern Hemisphere. I mean, it's, it's China and India. You know, China and India alone, depending how you measure it, some measures out there show that China and India are buying pretty much all of the world's production, uh, which says, well, what, then where is it? You know, why is the price not going up? Where's the gold coming from for everyone else? Well, it's been disordered. A lot of it is paper stuff, uh, pap- you know, paper buying that hasn't been delivered. And a lot of it has been, you know, like the U.S. said it has 8,000 tons of, of gold for the past 30 years. It probably has no gold left. Uh, and, you know, so and the same thing goes with the German gold that they couldn't find. Remember, they said we want our gold and they never got it back. So a lot of that gold, you know, the, we're talking about whatever inventory is out there is on fumes. And, uh, and what's really, what really drives the price at the margin right now is this paper selling on the COMEX. Uh, COMEX doesn't even have any gold. Uh, so again, you know, I think we're, we're you know, at the end of the road here for a cartel that's been suppressing prices for, for so long that they've, you know, they've gutted themselves. There's no more inventory, there's no more mining industry. And of course, what they've done is prolonged all the money printing to the point where the whole world is falling apart with the debt and the collapsing economy. And now you have social unrest and wars breaking out. So I think, you know, to me, uh, someone, you know, they always say when, and I say, I don't know when, I mean, I don't predict, but I look at where we are today and I say, I just can't see us getting through 2016 without something dramatic happening. And, you know, look at how it started. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not, it's not like anything's going to get better. They're not just going to come in and say, oh yeah, the central bank's going to print some money, everything's fine, and we'll get it through another year of Amazon.com trading it at, at, at dot com, you know, at, at internet stock prices from like the 1999. No, things are falling apart left and right right now. And most stock markets are down. Most stocks in the United States are down. Corporate bonds are getting crushed, junk bonds, commodities, currencies. So something is going to happen soon. It's just a matter of what and when. All right, for, so for level-headed individuals who want to protect themselves and their family from a potential upheaval from all the risks that you outline, we've talked in the past about how owning some precious metals is a responsible part of, a, of an overall plan. But if we could press you a little bit farther today on where, in your opinion, in a priority sense, does ownership and accumulation of precious metals correctly fit in the priorities of someone who is approaching preparedness compared to the other steps that they could be doing with their money? Well, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm a financial person, but I don't give financial advice. I mean, you know, I wrote an article years ago called um, uh, Protection Continuum. And really, you know, it's up, which basically means it's up to you. I say a one out of 10 on the Protection Continuum scale means move to Manhattan, put all your money in Citibank, and a, a 10 on the scale means move to a desert island, bury gold in the sand and forage for food. So you really have to decide what's best for you. There's no right number for me personally. I mean, most of my lignit, my liquid assets are in physical precious metals. I, I think getting out of debt is a good idea. I think if you're going to have cash, don't put it in the banking system. For me, I, I put it in non-marginable uh, brokerage accounts at companies like Schwab and Fidelity because they're not in the banking system and they and they're financially sound. But otherwise, you know, what you what you want to do with your money's up to you. I mean, if you put it in stocks at record high prices with record bad fundamentals and the banking system, which is, you know, to me it's completely insolvent. It relies solely on the Fed's free money just to survive and, you know, the economy's falling apart. That's your choice. I mean, you go outside of the financial realm, of course, you know, you you deal with on your website all kinds of other things to do to protect yourself, but financially there's nothing else I, I, I could imagine to do with my money. I, I own my house because I live here, not because I'm investing in it. Uh, I own precious metals for long term because they're insurance and, and I believe they'll protect my, my purchasing power from what's coming. And otherwise, I can't think of anything else. I really have an interest in owning. Financial assets are all massively overvalued. Uh, because of all the money printing. So pressing a little bit farther on that point of um, uh, if a person is taking steps to preparedness, it, it just again, and this is just your opinion, if they're looking after some emergency food, water supplies, uh, physical shelter, uh, ways of protecting those things, at what point 
in your mind, do you think, yeah, you better also consider precious metals as part of that? Because people talk about, and they've commented quite frequently on our channel about, you know, in a real collapse situation, all you're going to care about, all that's going to matter, all that's going to have immediate value is like, you know, food and weapons and medicine. Um, Just talking about making it through a chaotic situation where all the norms of society are broken down, that sort of thing. Well, that's that's the kind of thing where they say you can't eat gold and stuff. Well, you can't eat stock certificates either. I mean, you can't just take, I mean, look, let's say you have $100,000 savings. Are you just going to take the $100,000 today and buy $100,000 of food and have no money? to? No, of course you have to have, quote, you know, currency. Gold happens to be uh, money also in that it preserves value, but you, know, you have to have something around to buy things. Uh, and we could, if pe- and people say, well, what if we're in the uh, apocalypse situation? Well, then who cares if you have gold? If you're, if you're in an apocalypse, who, it doesn't, nothing matters. We're talking about if there's some kind of semblance of order in the world. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if you if people are killing each other, nothing matters except guns. Uh, but we're we're not talking about that situation. I mean, you can prepare for it, and of course, I advise everyone to to you know to have food and guns. I do all that stuff too. But you, we're talking about you have to have currency to purchase things in a real world, and you're not going to be able to use dollars in that kind of situation, and you're certainly going to be able to use gold and silver, uh, you know, and other things you can think along in a barter. But again, you know, I, I, whenever I always have, I have an article I wrote years ago and it's my answer to all the what if questions. I, you know, it's like, well, what if they confiscate gold and what if this and what if that? It's called priceless precious metals or, uh, versus worthless dollars. And you can Google it. It's from like 2012. And it's basically saying any kind of scenario like you're talking about, people say, well, what if this happens? Trust me. You will be happy that you have gold and silver instead of paper. You can always you can bridge you cross those other bridges when you get there. If you because believe me, the government is reactive. They don't just come out today and say, "Well, we're going to confiscate gold." No, when the dollar falls apart and we're in, and, and and everything is is in chaos, then they come out and say they, that they they're going to take the gold. But at that point, no one wants dollars anymore. So you just say, "Well, I'm happy I got the gold. I'll figure out what to do next." So again, you know, we're talking about preserving your purchasing power. You're not going to do it with paper money. Heck, you can't even get interest on that paper money right now, and you probably never will again, not until it's too late. Now, if people want to learn more about your broader perspectives on what's going on in the world economy and specifically the roles that precious metal can play in uh, options available to them, you mentioned a a free webinar. If you could tell us a little bit more about that. And I also uh, understand that you're going to be holding a free uh, in-person information session and discussion uh, in the Denver area, uh, January 28th. Uh, Could you talk to us about both of those? Right. And again, you know, Miles Franklin has been around for 27 years. We're one of the largest bullion dealers in the nation. Never had a registered complainant in all that time. And you can, of course, email me at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. Uh, yes, you know, I do a free blog every single day on milesfranklin.com. I do all these podcasts like yours. There's tons of stuff. It's all free in real time. And uh, and we do uh, some some d- uh, additional educational things. We're going to do a a major webinar, as I mentioned, on the silver market on, on January 27th. That'll be available on the internet. And as you say, uh, Andy Sheckman, the co-founder and president of the firm, and myself uh, will be doing a free uh, presentation here in the Denver Boulder area, January 28th. Uh, just come, ask questions. There'll be free food. And um, if you have an interest, in, you, know, you live around here, just email me or give us a call at 800-822-8080 and you're welcome to come. Well, Andy Hoffman, thank you once again for joining us on Reluctant Preppers, and we sincerely hope we can get you back on again soon. Our viewers uh, always appreciate your insights, and uh, you speak with a great amount of perspective and uh, awareness of what's going on, and that's what we're about here is helping people to be aware so that they can be prepared. Well, it's my pleasure. Anytime. Anytime.